Good afternoon, everybody, and Happy New Year. And welcome to the latest Sport Universe Town Lecture. It's 6th of January, so why wouldn't we want to talk about the sunshine of St. Kitts and Nevis? Uh, this afternoon we've got Dave Scally, a good friend of mine, to uh, give a talk about the Bradford City's legendary, now legendary trip to the West Indies in 1999. Uh, the last time I saw Dave do a public speech was at my wedding. Uh, but it was a Covid wedding, so there was only 15 people there. Uh, but he did okay. But he had drunk about 15 pints by the time he spoke. So, yeah, it wasn't rude or anything, so it was fabulous. So, yeah, we're really looking forward to this. Um, there's a few people of special interest in this talk that can't make it. Um, Gillian Mitchell has left her uh, photo album at the front here for people to look through. It's great and stuff, so please come and have a look at it after the talk's finished. It'll be online as usual, thanks to Joe and his recordings. Uh, Joe's even on about next season we might have a live stream. Imagine that live on the record cafe. <laughs> anyway, with no further ado, uh, this is, by the way, Dave was making notes furiously about 10 minutes ago. I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. Clearly improving his talk. Dave. <laughs> Thank you. Good morning. Um, if you've been to any of the previous lectures in this series, you'll have been very impressed by the level of erudition. Um, the speakers, they were all professors with PhDs, speak multi languages, have written many books. Uh, this is one of those. Uh, this is just a series of anecdotes. So don't expect too much. Um, okay, so the first thing to explain is how do we get to St Kitts? Um, um, so a bit of background on that. At the time was four of us, well, there was a few of us living in London, and there was a brilliant rail ticket called the Fab Four, where four of you could go from King's Cross to Forster Square for 48 quid return. So we used to get that for match days. And what we'd do when we got after the game, we'd go home and buy Leeds, and at Leeds Station, one person would go and get the, the off licence, one would go to the Burger King, and one would go to the news agent to get the pinks. And if you remember the pinks, it was a newspaper that came out on Saturdays after, after the games ended, but somehow they managed to get out about 15 minutes after a final whistle. And we'd read, you get all the results, all the reports, it was brilliant. But it was much better than the internet. I'd, I'd maintain <laughs> that now. I'd still prefer the pink to the internet. But anyway, one, one day, very near the end of the season, we're going home, everyone's got a copy of the pink, and we find this story, Bradford City's tour, so pre-season to all be some kids in the Caribbean and supporters are welcome to come along. It's a 10-day trip, all-inclusive resort, £1,000. Right, so £1,000 is a lot of money in them days. I think we were all in about 16000 before tax. So taking out about 900 a month. So 1000 was a lot. So we were all reading the article and we're going, yeah, that'd be great, that'd be brilliant, I'd love to go to that. But then you're thinking, yeah, it's a grand, though, we haven't got, we haven't got a grand, you know. But there's a train went south and we drank more of a beer. It, it changed a little bit. So by Doncaster, I'm just being a bit nice. My grandson was, it's a chance of a lifetime. <laughs> you can't, can't possibly miss the chance of a lifetime. By Peterborough, it was, we just borrow it, just stick it on the <laughs> um, By Stevenage, it was, we've been mad not to go. So we got to King's Cross and we went out and had a few more drinks and then thought a little more of it really. I just thought, yeah, that's just pub talk, isn't it? And I'm at work on Monday and the phone rings and it's Tony Cunningham and he says, you have to give me £100 and pay the balance by next Friday. <laughs> um, and it, it booked us all on, so that was it. Yeah, we're, we're going. So a, a few weeks later, we're all at Gatwick Airport. We got, we've been promoted, we've been to Wolves, got promoted, we're all at Gatwick Airport, and we're, we're sort of sat there, and we're going, oh, this, you know, he's you know, very excited. And Mr. Bloke's walking down and goes, he looks a bit like Dean Windus. And Graham goes, it is Dean Windus, you know, we're on the same flight as them now. And the, the point about the St. Kitts trip was, um, I think we invited fans in order to subsidise the charter flight, I think that might have been Jeffrey's idea. But because the fans were there, there was about 50 or 60 fans went, uh, we were all with the team all the time. We're on the same flights, we're in the same resort, we're eating at the same restaurants in the resort. And what was unprecedented, really, is the access we had because we're close to the players, we're close to management, we're close to uh, Jeff Richmond. So that was, which I'll touch on later. When I'll, move to that. I'll just give you some kids, some kids facts. Uh, this is some kids. It's a sort of tadpole shape, and we were staying down here on Frigate Bay. Um, what was good about that was from resort, you could either swim in the Atlantic 
or the Caribbean. And the Caribbean was much more sheltered. The Atlantic had much bigger waves. Obviously, all the city fans went to the Atlantic. <laughs> and uh, one of the funniest things I've ever seen is 40 Bradfordian lads standing in the sea, waves crashing over heads, going, you call that a wave? <laughs> call that wave? I've been to Scarborough, me. <laughs> but the Atlantic's now. That, was, that used to happen every day. So, uh, some, some kits facts. The population's only 40,000 in some kits. It's a big, big it's St Kitts and Nevis, it's two islands, but St Kitts itself is only 40,000. It's the smallest sovereign state in the Western Hemisphere. Um, and the capital, Basse-Terre, is only 14,000, which is about Shipley, isn't it? Or people. So that's... It's, it's a tiny place, but it was very, very friendly. And uh, we had a good time. So, well, some, some more things. Let's get rid of that picture. The reason... I think the reason we were at St Kitts was because the manager at the time was Seth Pot. Um, and there's a mural of them on the wall outside. And he paid over 500 games for City, but at the time he was the director of the St Kitts Football Federation, so he was both the manager of a national team and also overseeing the strategy for development. So that's why we were there. He was a very nice bloke, he was very chatty. And the other thing about St Kitts is all the taxi drivers only had one name. It's like, you know, like Sting or Madonna. But so, um, our favourite was one called Courage, which I thought was a pretty good name to have. But our favourite was Caesar. Because if we got a taxi into town, we could ride in Caesar's chariot. Which made everyone very happy. Uh, on, on the on resort, the resort was all inclusive. It was great. There was about three different restaurants. All the drink was free. It was it was really brilliant, um, but it had a golf course, and a lot of the it, I mean, advertised having a golf course, and the golf course was free to residents to play on. So quite a few keen golfers have brought their clubs from from Bradford, and um, you know, some kids. It's, it's thirty two degrees, nice degree humidity, and it, the golf course was free, but we insisted you hire a golf buggy because a golf buggy has a canopy, so that's the only way you get any shade. There was no other shade up, of course. Um, but all the Bradfordians, obviously. We weren't happy about having to pay for a buggy. They complained quite vigorously. And the hotel manager had to point out that if you play 18 holes in 32 degrees and 9 degree humidity without a buggy, you will die. <laughs> <laughs> you, know, you, can't, you can't actually play golf in this way. I don't even know why you could put your clubs, you know. It was like, I uh, go. Oh, sorry. sorry. But the other difficulty with playing golf there was sometimes the monkeys would come down from the trees and steal the balls because they thought they were fruit. Which, so they lost a lot of balls and it was very windy, so they lost a lot of balls. So that was a, a golf. <coughs> Where the next book? So anyway, the first game, City played and they played the St Kitts national team. And there was, a, there was an opening ceremony. This is Mark Ballard, if you can see him. He looks unimpressed with the opening ceremony, doesn't he? He was, I think he was about 17, 18 at the time, and he absolutely had the time of his life. He, he, he couldn't believe his luck. He'd just signed a professional contract and he's on holiday in the Caribbean. All, all being the training was very difficult. So we won the first game 4 1. St. Kitts weren't, in fairness, they weren't particularly good. Not their amateurs, but um, let's, let's put a few over there. We shall. So we won the first game for one. Here's a management team. It's Chris Hutchins, Terry Oroth, Paul Joel. Uh, so that was good. Came back, everyone was in good spirits. We're all in the, in the bar and everyone was having a nice time. So that was good. The next game, we played Canada. And Canada, here we are, here we are. Canada's team was an under-23 team. There they are. And our thinking was, because we were a bit naive at the time, we thought, oh, Canada under-23s, they can't be much good. But the under-23 team with their Olympic squad. And the difficulty with this game was our players were just trying to get fit and get ready for the first league game against Middlesbrough in the Premiership. And their players were trying to qualify for Canada's Olympic squad. <laughs> so our lads just wanted a bit of a runabout and they wanted to win. So there were some very tasty tackles went in. Very tasty tackles. And, you know, we had to make quite a lot of subs and the City team weren't very happy about it and the City fans weren't very happy about it. 
and the, the resort we're staying in was called the Black Tower Resort, and there were chants of, we'll see you back at Black Tower. <laughs> For the city fans and Canada, Canada well outnumbered because they had no fans with them. It's just and we were all, and we were all under twenty three. Uh, but as it turned out, we got fed back to the bar. We thought it might be a bit frosty, but it was all right because they were all actually quite nice lads. And they explained to us we're trying to get into the Olympic team. But, you know, we can't can't take it easy. I mean, yeah, that was perfectly reasonable. So that was was all right in the end. But in terms of access, one of the great things was. You had access because we're in the same resort with the players. You could you could book all the players, and what was really nice was Jeffrey Richmond. Every morning, he'd set up under a canopy in, by the swimming pool, and you could go and ask him anything you wanted, and he'd tell you. You know, it was, and you never get this level of access before or since. You know, this has never happened, and you could go and ask him. And one day, I was was chatting with him, and I said, uh, "You're here, and Paul Jules here. Who's minding the shop back home?" And he goes, "Well, Sean Hardy. Sean's in charge." And I said, has Sean got executive decision-making powers? <laughs> Jeffrey looked at me and said, Sean has the, the power to ring me and ask. <laughs> Assume he can, he can get through. It was really interesting because you could ask him anything about football and he'd tell you. So I would say at the time I thought we, thought we should sign Matt Holland from Ipswich, the midfield at Island Midfield. He was, had a really good season for Ipswich that year. And... Uh, Jeffrey Richmond said to me, he said, I really like Matt Holland. Paul Jewell loves Matt Holland. And we would break the bank to sign him. We, you know, he'd be our record signing him. He said, but the trouble is, Ipswich needed three million pounds by the end of a month. Uh, and, it, you know, we could, if, if they'd still needed three million, we'd got him. But they just sold Kieran Dyer to Newcastle for six million. And that's that. And, like, you, that's the sort of insight you don't get. And he said, also, he said, Matt Holland's got kids. He's settled. He doesn't want to move north. And in fact, Matt Holland never did move north. He got his kid. He went to Charlton and he had his kids settled in school. So, but that's it's just that sort of access you don't get. And that was, you know, it was fascinating. And then after training one day, because the, the players trained between about eight and 10. After 10, it was too hot. Even at eight o'clock, it was really too hot. But by 10, it was, it was unbearable. So he finished training at 10. And what the fans did was we'd get up early. You had to because it was so hot. You'd have breakfast about half seven. Then you'd go and swim in either the Atlantic or the Caribbean. And then you'd come back, sit by the pool and drink beer. And it was all inclusive. So if you got too hot, you just jumped in the pool. When you came back out, if your beer got too warm, you'd floor it and gone forward. You weren't paying. It was done. Anyway, I forgot to warn you, but there is some swearing in this talk. But it's all reported speech. It's not me. Uh, but, but there is a bit coming up, more, sort of more or less now. <laughs> on, one, on one occasion, they came back from training, and Wayne Jacobs, Gareth Wallach, and me and Tony, and we sat having a drink on a little island in a man-made lake, but in the river resort. And Tony was really excited because the fixtures had come out, and we were due to play Manchester United away on Boxing Day, and. We were, Tony was going, oh, it's going to be such a good Christmas gaff, you know, he's brilliant, we'll have Christmas Day, I remember Old Trafford and Boxing Day, you know, we'd be really, really excited, be brilliant. And Gareth Wally just looked at him and raised an eyebrow and said, yeah, but you want to come to us to chase Roy Keane all around Old Trafford. <laughs> that's that sort of access you can't pay for. Yeah. I've got an interesting one here. This is um, this work. This is Morris Widdison, who ran a big um, he ran a big sports shop in the middle of Bastet, the capital, and he was from Leeds originally. And I think he had a connection with Beaver Sports and Beaver Sports. Did they make our kit or something? Yeah. yeah. Well, he also made this in kids' kit. This kit, yeah, some kids' kit. So I mean, there's the Beaver Sports shirts in the background here. But he was um, he had the, he, he, because he was from Leeds and we were from Bradford, he had the impression that we'd all be mates because we're all from West Yorkshire. <laughs> which, which I found rather naive. <laughs> and uh, at one game, Shirley Durant was, um, there was a retired teacher who actually used to teach Paul Jill's children. But Shirley Durant was set next to the Minister for Prisons. Who, who, and they got on very well, they got on very well. And um, the Minister for Prisons asked Shirley if she knew this bloke, Morris, 
and say, you know, because you're big, big cheese in the town. And Shirley said, yeah, but he's from Leeds. Mm. And he was like perplexed because he didn't realise the rivalry. And he was like, well, what does that mean? He goes, well, you know, people from Leeds, people from Bradford don't often get on. And, he goes, and, then, and she goes, you know, I'm a bit worried that there's a risk of disorder. <laughs> and the Minister of Prison just went like this. And two policemen came down and took him out of the ground. In order to prevent disorder. I think we're only messing, they let him back in later, but he was just, he was just demonstrating his power. <laughs> that was a good, we enjoyed that bit. Uh, everyone was drinking Carib, which is Carib was brewed in St Kitts, so that's the local beer. And the other big drink was uh, Vodka Ting. Ting's are uh, just sparkling grapefruits, you just put that in vodka or gin, and that was a very, very popular drink. Everyone was drinking that much. <laughs> drink a background for you. The pictures of Gillian Midgley, that's Gillian at the time. But this was obviously, you know, it was a while ago, wasn't it? So the second game, we played Canada. And the third game was Canada versus St Kitts. Uh, St Kitts took the lead, surprisingly, uh, but Canada then equalised. Uh, this is St Kitts taking the lead. Canada equalised, so Canada won the trophy. So uh, you know, no one really cared. Paul Jules thought he was just a trainer, so it isn't bloody well. <laughs> Before the Canada game, uh, we were out, but the players sort of had a curfew. They had to stay in their rooms, really, and they weren't really allowed out in the evening. There was one night where Peter Brigery broke the curfew because um, he was just bored. And he came he came out, we were drinking with him, you know, quite a long time. And Peter Brigery's a really good raconteur, he told really loads of really good stories. And uh, But he was always on his toes because he was waiting, he was looking around for the management, making sure he wasn't yet spotted because he'd got fined. And he had, he had to go and hide him in the toilets on several occasions. <laughs> But we asked him a story. There used to be a famous urban myth. I don't know if you remember this. There used to be a myth about Peter Beagle on a tour with Everton. He'd written a motorbike through a play glass window. So, so, and that was, you know, it was, well, this was pre internet, really. So that was wide, quite widely held view. You know, it was an urban myth. It was prevalent. And I asked him about that, and he went, no, he goes, no, never happened. He said, it wasn't a motorbike, it was a moped. <laughs> <laughs> And he goes, I didn't ride it through a plate glass window. I read it round it up the steps and through the open doors of a hotel. The doors were open. I didn't break anything. I just rode it into the lobby for a laugh of the lads. And he goes, unfortunately, I got lost. It wasn't my hotel. <laughs> I don't know how that went down with the locals. But that, was a, that was a good one. Anyway, the night before the Canada game, we were in the bar and we were talking to Paul Jewell and uh, we talking about various things and it was great. Again, he was talking about Michael Bridges and we were talking about Robbie Blake. And every now and then I said, oh, Paul, can I play tomorrow? And he goes, no. And I go, oh, come on, Paul. And he's going, no. And I said, I just, I just, I don't want to play play. I just want to, I'll come on as a time-wasting substitute in the injury time so I can just point an imaginary watch next to the referee. And I said, but then I can say... I'll play for City and I can die happy. And he went, no. <laughs> he said, I'm running a f***ing football club, not a circus. <laughs> but I kept on it. I kept, I kept bringing it back to it. And uh, he, he was going, no, 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 no chance, mate. No chance. And uh, I said, I brought my boots. I brought my boots, Paul. I brought my boots 4,000 miles. <laughs> And in the end, I broke him down. In the end, I said, oh, come on, Paul, this is ridiculous. I've made over 200 appearances in Dave Evans' old number six shirt for Bradford City London supporters. So in the end, I broke, I broke him. So he made me an offer. He said, all right, son, here's the deal. He goes, you'll come to training tomorrow, seven o'clock sharp in the lobby. And if you withstand a training session, I'll put you on the bench. So you can't come on because you're not a registered player and it's a fee for all species tournament. And, if, you know, if you came on and injured someone, I'd be in trouble. Well, I'll put you on the bench, so you'll be, you'll be on the team sheet. So at least you'll have been on the city team sheet. 
but you've got my standard training session and don't be late, seven o'clock in the morning. The only drawback with this is by the time I broke him, it was three o'clock in the morning. So I have, I have four hours kit and then turned up in reception. And you got to remember this is 1999, so I was 32 and I was playing amateur football, Sunday football, but I was playing about two or three times a week. So I was like in reasonable nick, you know, I could just about pass for a football league, you know. So I, was in, I turned up in the lobby with me, me boots and a carrier bag. And all the other players are immediately suspicious. <laughs> They're going, who, who's this? And it, it was interesting because they sort of, they fell into three camps. They fell into um, the ones who just had seen me about and knew I was a supporter, the ones who didn't know, and the credible, credulous ones who thought I was a player. And <laughs> I got on the lot minibus to the training ground and I was sat between my two favourite players, Isaiah Rankin and Robbie Blake, the proof, the truth and the prophet. And, and they both, they, you know, they, they thought I was a player, they're going, who are you, son? And I said, I'm in new, I'm in your midfield, and I'm come on a Bosman, I want all we could afford, I'm on a Bosman. And they said, oh, where have you come from? And then I was thinking, where, I've got to think of someone they won't have heard of. And they won't know any players there, and won't have any mates. And, I went, and for some reason, it just came into my head. I said, Lugano in Switzerland. That's, that's Lugano's kit, I see. And that seemed to satisfy him. So we got to the training ground, and I missed all of them. And we go, where do you play? And I said, uh, centre mid. And all the midfielders on the bus froze. <laughs> and they were all like, ooh, position's under threat. So we get to the training ground and Wayman Webinar pulls me aside and he clearly sussed it and he said, like, we're doing training, mate. Do your stretches. And he was really not kind. He was like, do your stretches, make sure it's, it's really hard in this weather. It's really hard. And he goes, uh, do your stretches. So we do such. We're doing a bit of, because they were playing that night, we were just doing really light jogging. I'm very light jogging, a bit of stretching, light jogging. So it wasn't actually that hard and I could keep up. I dropped it to third place in the line. I thought, didn't want to lead. Didn't want it too showy. <laughs> Dropped into third place, and then um, Sharp is behind me. And I'm going, come on, Sharp, you keep up, son. You're not the leads now. It's a proper club. <laughs> so, so we're going around, and it's not actually that difficult. You know, it was. I mean, it was really hot, and the humidity was bad, but we weren't putting out much energy, so it, it didn't really matter. And then Paul Jewell turns up an hour late because he can't take his ale. And he's having a he's having a natter with Terry Yorth and pointing at me and Terry Yorth's going, well, he seems to be holding up for running. <laughs> he's going, well, Paul Jules, he's in a pickle then because he's going to have to put me on the bench. So he calls me over and he introduces me to uh, Andy Myers. And I'm just a picture of Andy Myers. We just sat, we just signed Andy Myers from Chelsea for a million pounds, which would have been close to our record signing at the time. It'd have been in the top three. Um, I think was I always 1.2, and I think Lee Mills might have a million. But we just signed him for a million quid. So he brings over Andy Myers and he goes, Andy, this is Dave. Yeah, Dave, Andy just joined us, so he hasn't done any pre season so he needs to do extra work. He goes, uh, so if you could uh, just jog around with Dave for a bit, jog, you two jog, just run around together, just do a few laps. Now, the, the laps, this is quite interesting because the ground, Warner Park, is both a cricket and a football ground. <laughs> so, so the lap was the whole thing. It was, a, it was a, the whole thing. So we're we jogging around again because Andy Myers is new and he actually thinks I'm in the squad. <laughs> he's, he's deferring to me, so he's letting me set the pace. So, so I'm just sort of jogging around quite lightly. It's a long way. We did a couple of laps. And Andy's just going, he's not he's chatty. He's going, where do you play? And I'm a centre back. And he goes, how long have you been playing? And I went, mm, it seems it's about nine, about 30 years. And he said, you don't look old enough to play for fair. And I said, I don't know, yeah, played since, since I was nine. And he goes, no, how long have you played professionally? I said, I don't play professionally. <laughs> I thought, I can't be mean to him because he's new. You know, I said, no, I played I play for Bradford City London Supporters Club. <laughs> and he's going, I said, you're not, you're not, you're not in the team. I said, no, I'm, I'm one of the supporters. I went, you know, I talked Joe into it in the bar last night. I said, it took me till three o'clock. And like, you could see the cops going around in his head. He's going, I've just signed for a million pounds. And, and I'm, I'm, 
be keeping pace with the bloke who was in a bar till three in the morning and his play Sunday league. And so with that, he just sped away. <laughs> he put the afterburners on and just sped away. It was like watching a kingfish across a river. And I, I couldn't go near catching up with him, so I sort of limped to the end of the lap. I limped to the end of the lap and lay down on the finish line. And I was just gasping for breath. But basically, it was, it was almost impossible to breathe. I was gasping for breath. And then it went down, the shadow came over me. And I looked up, and it was Terry Yorath, who was a coach. I'm sorry, swearing a lot. <laughs> Terry Yorath says to me, who fucking said you could lie down in my fucking training session and stat? And I looked at my bin. I thought, no, hang on, I don't play for Brentford, do I? So I said, f off, Terry, I don't work for you. And he just gave me a massive grin and said, oh, sorry, mate, I just thought you'd like the full experience. <laughs> so that was, um, that was the highlight. And then... Paul Jewell thought, well, we've broken him. He's not made the session. So, so he's just kicking some balls about me and him. And the, the difference, uh, we're, me, Paul and Jill and I were about 40 yards apart and we're just kicking the ball to each other. And the, this is the difference between like professional and amateur. I'm having to work really hard to get it to him. I like, kick it as hard as I can. And he's just stroking it back to him. It's flying at me. I mean, it's flying at me, but I trapped every ball, dro dropped it down on my phone. And he, said, he turned to Yorath and said, Decent touch that one, and that that's a highlight of my football career. It was downhill ever since then. That was it. Yeah, let's see what else we got. There's a young, I think, from you know, Graham Fawcett. There's you, Graham Fawcett, the bottom left, and there, there's Tony Cunningham, the late Tony Cunningham, and that's um, Shirley Graham behind. Uh, I know the most of them. Um, we've got some video. Does anyone want to see some video? Let me see. Let me see if we can find it. Good morning, everybody. We'll be out in seconds. This is the neighbors to the ground. There's the truth. And you can see the ground. That was a grandstand. It was very developed at that time. But it was very hot. You can see him working. And then well, one of the highlights of the trip was we did a catamaran uh, trip to Nevis. So you go across, it's only about 30 minutes straight to Nevis. So the phones went, and then the next day, the players went. Uh, Jeffrey Mitchell bought it for the players, he'd be hiding. There we all are. And Andy Myers wouldn't go in because he was scared of sea serpents. <laughs> I, suggest, I think Lee Sharp might have told him about that. <laughs> <laughs> we went to Nevis, it's lovely, this catsman, brilliant, had a net between the two holes, and you just lay on the net, and the crew brought you drinks, and Bob Marley was playing, it was all brilliant. Peter Beagree said he'd, um, he'd let the fat lads go in first because the sharks would get a bigger. <laughs> we'll get more. Well, this was absolutely idyllic, this beach in, in Nevis, and the crew made a barbecue. It's absolutely fantastic. So, we've obviously never been anywhere quite as good since. I mean, the, re the year before we did an army camp in Chester, I think under Peter Taylor we taught Essex. Uh, there was one game in Spain this summer, wasn't there? But the thing is, we've never been anywhere like this. And the, the thing that really resonates is that we've never had access to the players and the management that we did, you know, 60 quid, well, 60 people, and you could speak to everybody. I remember going back and speaking as an Arsenal fan in London, and he was going, no, mate, if Arsenal did that, they'd get 5,000 there. And I went, yeah, but Arsenal wouldn't do it, would they? <laughs> That's the whole point. You know, you're just a customer to them. Like, you, you wouldn't, whereas we were considered of members, as it were. So, as I said, it was just a rambling collection of anecdotes. 
But um, that's what I've got. If anyone's got any questions, happy to answer them. Did you get a shirt from uh, the same kids team? Yeah, we knew they all bought uh, St. Kitts team shirts in order to wear them at the St. Kitts Canada game, but I couldn't find it. I was looking for it at home, but I couldn't find it. They were they're quite scratchy, those Beaver kids. They weren't, they, weren't the, they weren't the top quality. I mean, they looked really impressive because half people want that. And I thought, oh, that looks good, but so not good to wear. No, not really. The other interesting thing was they had, they had a home kit and away kit, and one was green and one was red. And the two political parties in, the, in St. Kitts and Nevis one is green and one is red. So, but, but their fans would buy the colour that represented the party they supported, which is quite interesting. So they, they um, one was the away kit, and initially Beaver didn't make much of the away kit, and then they found out they needed to make quite a lot of them because they were just a populist. Do you think they'd like Jeffrey Redstone to come back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yes, I mean, there's, there's a couple of documentaries, so that, that one was a Sky one, and there is, if you look on YouTube, there was a calendar documentary, which is on YouTube in three parts, which is quite interesting, just look up Bradford City St Kitts, um, and Rich one's most relaxed I ever saw him, he was, um, you know, he used to sit there holding call, he enjoyed it, he liked seeing the players enjoying themselves, and what happened in the evenings was, there was a key to casino in the resort, we'd all go to the casino, we would just wash up there. And Paul Hill would be there, like, begging Richmond for more money. And it was like watching a kid with his, you know, some, some begging his dad in a Blackpool or something, going, you know, because he was rubbish at whatever he was playing. And they'd go, oh, Jeff, have you got any more of those dollars? <laughs> but Richmond would go, oh, So, yeah, but it was quite a good bonding trip. And I think it did quite a lot for team morale. We, we started the season quite well, didn't we, that year? And, no, uh, but I... We've never done anything before or since anything like it. That was what was so unique. Yeah. And Richmond, you know, whatever you think about, obviously bankrupt the club, but he got us into the Premiership, took us to St Kitts and rebuilt the ground. So in the end, after the training session, Paul Jill said to the players, he said, all right, we're playing tonight, so just go, go in your room, stay in your room, have a kit. So I went back, like a professional footballer, went back to my room and had a kit. And we, and we used to stay in... Between sort of 12 and 3, we used to say in my rooms anyway because it was too hot to go out. We just watched Bond movies or whatever it was at the time. But yeah. No, I felt I was waiting for the kit man to come around all afternoon and he never did. But uh, that was fair enough because, you know, that was a deal and I didn't actually withstand the training session. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah. Uh, just to say, uh, you do yourself a bit of a disservice, Dave. Uh, there's some people here that remember you were a very, very good footballer yourself, albeit at a, a lower level. You played international football for Bradford City against teams from Ireland, Scotland and Belgium, as, as some of us know. And uh, just wondering if you, what your favourite uh, anecdote uh, from those years with the London team? I'm not we, we played, um, the, the Mechelen was the one to feel. We played Mechelen away, uh, Mechelen supporters. Um, we, we'd written to them and say, can we come and play you? Um, they came back and said, yeah. Yes, because Mechelen, well, if you had a dodgy telly, it looked like Clarence Amber. It was actually red and yellow. But on my telly, it looked Clarence Amber. So we, we'd been over and watched them a couple of times on base of the colours. And then we thought, oh, we'll try and get a game. So... I tried to ring up, but this was, it was difficult because I couldn't get the number and there was, you know, it was pre-internet. Um, there was international director inquiries, but I didn't know what they were called because we just said, we just saw it was Mechelen and actually it was KV, Kernicular Football Club to Mechelen. So I was trying to get it. I got the Me um, Belgian Olympic Committee and then I got old club to Mechelen. I thought that'll be it. So I rang them up and in very bad French asked them when they were next playing at home and it turned out it was a casino. <laughs> he, he was quite puzzled. Anyway, in the end, we got through and we organised a game. So we, we took a team in, and all my, all my so London supporters had said they wanted to play, and then when it came to it, they weren't available. So we had a bit of a scratch team. 
um, one, of them, one of them sat there and rolled. He lived in Manchester at the time. And I said, uh, rang him up and said, do you want to play football Saturday? And he goes, yeah, all right. So where are we playing? I went, the way we played? I said, oh, oh. I said, yeah, meet me at Victoria, bring your passport. So we got the train to Mechelen and we, they met us at the stair, they met us at uh, Mechelen station and um, three cars and drove us to this youth hostel where you're going to stay, which um, was quite nice. And then um, the, the, their organiser, I asked, he said, you know, what's your team like? And I said, it's not very strong, mate, we've had to call in players with one bloke hasn't played for 20 years, one's ill. And, uh, you know, it's not, it's not a strong team. What about yours? And he goes, ah, well, what we did was we circulated our 50 supporters clubs and asked them to nominate their best player. <laughs> he goes, and then from the 50, we whittled it down to a squad of 16. <laughs> so I thought this could be a long day. And then they, they walked us around this lake. We'd, been, we'd come overnight on a ferry. They walked us around the lake, which is about a three-mile walk, and then took us to the ground. We go to the ground and I go to toss up with their captain and their captain looked like Jaws from the James Bond film. It was a dead ringer. And I did the toss, looked at their team, and I turned around and just made this gesture to, to our side. Uh, we, we could actually take him a lead in the first minute. Bobby Greenland missed no Trungol in the first minute, but they were they were four up by half time. And then they took their, they, we didn't want to embarrass us, so they took their foot off the one four nil. But that was a that was a great trick. Right, brilliant, fabulous, Dave. That's really good, and I really, really enjoyed the uh, the anecdotes. Uh, Joe, I'll have to put some bleeps in for the YouTube video, I guess. <laughs> so it'll be about four minutes. <laughs> no, fabulous stuff. It did make me think about um, the Intertoto Cup, which came next year. I went across to um, Lithuania, which, if I had to talk about that, we did a lot of bleeps. <laughs> it was an incredible trip, and I think a lot of people went to a ball league, didn't they? That was marvellous. Uh, so we should revisit all this stuff because it is all 20 odd years ago, isn't it? Good God, where's the time going? Anyway, talking of time going, um, next talk is on the 17th of February and it's Catherine Hay and Steve Bolton talking about the history of women's football. Steve Bolton's grandmother played for Dick Kerr's ladies, the leading team of the 1920s, and Steve now is one of the leading um, historians on women's football. It's a brilliant blog. Catherine, a lot of you will know anyway. Uh, she lives in Bradford. She's a direct descendant of the Hayes Breweries. They're going to talk about women's football in the 20s. Hayes ladies football team. I might do five minutes on cricket as well because I went on to be on a cricket side. And, uh, yeah, so looking forward to that. So hope to see you again. But thanks again, Dave. Brilliant stuff. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.